Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we assemble on this Sabbath, shall we seek the Lord's guidance as we open his word so that we may more truly understand that which he would have us to know? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these opportunities we have to assemble together. We appreciate this, that we may do so in safety at this time, knowing full well that times are soon to come when meetings like this may be difficult and may be dangerous. Help us, Father, as we open this study, that we may be able to speak and speak freely. Direct us, please, in all that you would have us to understand. Guide us as we open your word. Guide us as we open the word of your prophet. Show us that which we need to understand for this time in earth's history and for the preparation for the time that is soon before us. Be with us now, each one. I thank you for those, Father, that have chosen to join this morning in this meeting. May they each have a blessing of that which we are about to study. For this we thank you, and for this we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay. We are now going to continue the study in the Minor Prophets that Mrs. White lined out should be studied in conjunction with what book? The book of Daniel. Now, the studies over the last several Friday nights, beginning of Sabbath, have been on the presidents of the United States based upon studies that Brother Colin had presented. But we're going to be looking at these and laying some other groundwork for other items that Daniel had noted, but we're going to look at this through the lens of the prophets that preceded Daniel. So we're going to turn to the book of Zephaniah. Now it's interesting to me in this particular chapter, this is one of the rare chapters where, as the translators looked at this, there were to only be two divisions. And they were to occur on verse 1 and verse 2. So, Theodore, if you would, would you please read Zephaniah 1.1? 1, 1. Yeah, so, um, so we're going to have the time that uh, Zephaniah 1, it has these two sections, the time when Zephaniah prophesied and God's severe judgment against Judah for diverse sins. So Zephaniah 1.1, 1, 1. the word of the Lord came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hilkiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Now, why is this important to, for us to note? Um, well, that he's um, in the time of Josiah. Yeah. Why is this important? Well, because then it would help us explain the context of what's going to be being talked about. So the reforms of Josiah that are going to occur. And uh, so that's what he's going to address. And basically the failure of those reforms ultimately, which is going to lead to the captivity of Daniel. Okay, now the, the part of this and what I, I started looking at very briefly Elder Jeff had lined out the kings of Judah along with the presidents of the General Conference, correct? Yes. Um, so that study uh, was actually Colin's study. So he had laid out uh, the 
the con so basically well he had dealt with the republican presidents and and the presidents of the general conference that was Collins study is that what you're referring to no not at all oh okay so you're saying elder jeff had done a study okay that went through where he lined out the kings of judah along with the the different presidents of the general conference didn't he or am i am i mistaken i think you're mistaken because the only thing i know about the conference presidents was lining them up um having to do with the the presidents the republican presidents and because that would be the presidents of um northern israel and then the presidents of the general conference would be the presidents of judah and so they we had this study where there was 19 um republican presidents and 20 uh general conference presidents okay then i'll i, I will stand corrected at this point okay now <clears throat> One of the things that I noted in preparing for this presentation was that Mrs. White does have many comments that she has made regarding the book of Zephaniah. If you were to take a look, there's an additional document that I sent to you, Theodore. Yeah. Okay. This document. Uh, is from Testimony 23 of 1873. Yeah. You can also find this in Three Testimony, page 270, and it's an excerpt. Okay, so you want me to read that then? Please. Okay, so I'll just bring this up. <clears throat> there are many who do not have the discretion of Joshua and who have no special duty to search out wrongs and to deal promptly with the sins existing among them. Let not such hinder those who have the burden of this work upon them. Let them not stand in the way of those who have this duty to do. Some make it a point to question and doubt and find fault because others do the work that God has not laid upon them. These stand directly in the way to hinder those upon whom God has laid the burden of reproving and correcting prevailing sins in order that his frown may be turned away from his people. Should a case like Aiken's be among us, there are many who would accuse those who might act the part of Joshua in searching out the wrong of having a wicked fault finding spirit. God is not to be trifled with and his warnings disregarded with impunity by a perverse people. Okay. Now, yep. This this portion, as it is written, is very direct. Now, as we go forward in this excerpt, we're going to be tying this directly back to the book of Zephaniah. Okay. Yeah, because we had studied this, of course, when we were studying Joshua. Um, okay. um, I was shown that the manner of Achan's confession was similar to the confessions that some among us have made and will make. They hide their wrongs and refuse to make a voluntary confession until God searches them out, and then they acknowledge their sins. A few persons pass on in a course of wrong until they become hardened. They may even know that the church is burdened, as Achan knew that Israel were made weak by their enemies because of his guilt. Yet, their consciences do not condemn them. They will not relieve the church by humbling their proud, rebellious hearts before God and putting away their wrongs. God's displeasure is upon his people, and he will not manifest his power in the midst of them while sins exist among them that are fostered by those in responsible positions. Now, in this, in this paragraph, Mrs. White is very direct, but scripture is also very direct. Because of the sin of one man and one family, Israel was weakened. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I'm not willing to point fingers. All fingers I point directly at myself. Mm -hmm. There are those that have made it very clear in communication with me that they believe that my attitude, that if I am pointing a finger at one, that three are pointed back at myself, that they believe that this is too much of the world. Now, I feel for them, but I do not agree with them. Well, the one thing that God has been showing us, and, and we saw this clearly in the study last night. Yes. And, and with Odilio's study, the upper room study, I mean, one of the things that we believe is that we have to have an upper room experience and that God is leading this movement in that direction. Right. As much as we see all of this bitterness and fault finding that can exist, we know that, that we have a work to do in confessing our sins to one another where we have wronged each other and that God needs to bring this movement together in a united fashion that we can easily justify our actions. Every single one of us has justifications around why we do what we do, why we say what we say, but that's not going to help us right. when it comes to doing the Lord's work. But the work of, of self-justification is not the work of a Christian. So when we when we look at the upper room study from last night and we see – you know, and I was talking with Heidi about this, but, you know, we look at Thomas. Who does Thomas represent? Well, I think Thomas represents us. I mean, we could try to say, well, Thomas represents someone else. But we're in that situation of Thomas where we need to be reconciled to the by faith to this message that God has given us. And, and it doesn't help us to see Thomas as someone else. Now, we, we can make an application and we can see, and, and the application was made. If we look at what Idilio is presenting, he's presenting basically Thomas's point of view. That is, Thomas expected uh, Christ to become, you know, to overthrow the Romans and to set up his kingdom on this earth. And we could parallel that to July 18 of what we were expecting with God vindicating us. And yet we know that, um, and I know not everybody's, you know, who's watches this has maybe seen the study from last night and you should, but, um, you know, it seems to me based upon everything that God has been leading this movement to is that, We all are, in a sense, trying to, to do what Odilio is doing. We may have other ways in which we're trying to do it. Now, we know that God is vindicating his name and that he is revealing to us light to correct us. And that the experience that we had was one of instruction. It is July 18th, and all of that experience was an instructive experience to prepare a people to do a work. And there's no way that we can say we're prepared if we don't come to the upper room. And so in a sense, the upper room has been waiting for us and we're hesitant to go there. But we do go there eight days after and Christ appears in our midst. And is this not what this movement needs? Isn't it essential? Would, would people agree with me? Any comments on that? Yes, I've been saying that for some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God's been telling us this for, for a long time. But it's, it's so easy to say, well, the problem lies outside of us. You know, it's someone else is is the one that needs to confess their sins. But that's not going to help us at all if we're not willing to do that. 
Now, when we speak of this with the upper room experience, yeah. Are we also not giving reference to the widow of Zarephath? So you're talking about the the two sticks and the oil of a uh, cruise of oil and uh, uh, Am I saying this wrong? The widow whose son was raised. Okay. Okay, so that's going to be, um, yeah, so you're talking about Elisha raising the, the seven times. So my question is this. Seven times, yeah. my, my question is this. <clears throat> the child that is raised, does, not, not, does that not become typified by the movement? Okay, so this is a good question, because um, I was having this discussion um, on Messenger. Um, so this, it's the brother from Vietnam was asking me all these questions, because um, he was noticing things that I'd written that I didn't notice that I'd written. Um, so he was asking these questions about the two sticks, and then uh, trying to understand that. And then we came to this widow, uh, the son represents the individuals that came out of the Protestant. The widows matched the two angels' message. Uh, okay, so he's going to address this. Where is this here? Um, so he says there's three of seven times in Elijah and Elisha. So I'm not sure what he means by that. Uh, or three seven times. So th stories where three, seven times occur. That right. is, Elijah prays for rain right. uh, at seven times. The child in the story of Elisha. But he says that the mom here is not the widow. I'm not sure. Because um, this is the woman who builds the room for Elisha. Mm -hmm. Whether that's the same woman or not. I always assumed it was. But um, And then the story of Naaman. And, and then you just asked, do these point to the seven times of Leviticus 26? And, uh, and then he sent me a quote where Ellen White from Great Controversy, uh, 1888 Great Controversy, where it says, since 1804, more than 187,000 copies of the Bible have been circulated. It's interesting, that number there, 187 million, yep. is in the spirit of prophecy in connection with God's word. But anyway, um, so anyway, that was the question. So we have these seven times in the book of Elijah and Elisha. Uh, and they would they would then be representative of Leviticus 26 of the seven times. So you bring up here, you're going to bring up the woman with the child that's resurrected Correct. by the seven times. Correct. Um. So some more thoughts on that? Well, the situation is that the woman's pride was in this child. Yeah. The child was fine. And then the child goes out into the field, falls ill and dies. Yeah. So Elijah comes back and is called goes up, takes the child to the room, the upper room, and seven times he is, presenting his case, basically, right? Um, I mean, I'm, okay, so this is the story here. Um, yeah. I'll just go to this, to the scriptures. Okay. So so we have the Elisha and the widow's oil. All right. So this is the widow of Zarephath. No, 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 this is the, no, this is a different story. This is the widow who takes all the oil and borrows the vessels. Okay. Um, here, let's, let's read this story. I know this is off our, our study, but... Um, now, there was a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets 
un, uh, and there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, but thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. So th this does become a parable, right? Right. Okay. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. And so she went from him and shut the door upon her and her, upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. So what is it we see here in this story? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, what about this shut door? Another closed door. Okay. So, what is this closed door? The closed door after the Sunday law. Okay. So, this would be the closed door of the Sunday law, and this oil is the, la the oil of the loud cry. Well, isn't isn't the Holy Spirit poured out after? I mean, poured out without measure after the the message is is fully given. Yeah, yeah. and so these vessels, those that receive the Spirit. Yeah. Okay. So so now we then we have Elisha and the Shunammite woman. So and it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunam, where was a great woman. And she constrained him to eat bread, and so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. And then she's going to make this chamber, right? Um, so it's, it's going to be on, on the roof. It says on the wall, but it's going to be up above. And let us set for him there a bed, a table, a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on that day that he came thither and turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he, and she, he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to a king, to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And then we're going to have this child grow, right? And it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to, his re to the reapers. And he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to the lad, carry him to his mother. He said to a lad, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. And then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. And so she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to Gehazi his servant, 
Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. And then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not, and if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them, and laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him, and told him, saying, The child is not awake. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead, and laid upon his bed. And he went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked to the, in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of information in here. Now, this so, is the story you're referring to, right? That's the story I'm referring to. Okay, so what's the comparison? We have background here now. Okay, so before the child dies in 2 Kings 4.19, yeah. he says to his father, my head, my head. A doubling. A doubling. Now, since this is a doubling, this is a child that recognizes the second angel's message. Mm -hmm. And it's also 419. Yes. Well, that's going to be the first day of the first month in 18. Okay. And, and it's interesting, the, the word Rashi, my head, is, um, uh, so that's the word Rosh, right? Uh, right, which means chief, and it's seven two one eight is the number. So it has the numbers of um, July eighteen twenty. Right. So just in a different order. Okay. Now, the mother, the Shunammite. Yeah is distressed mm -hmm. but the situation of everything that's that's a problem with her becomes withheld from elijah but now she is to saddle an ass mm -hmm. islam islam so The elements of everything prophetic are found within this story. Yeah, and we also have the Mount Carmel, which is, of course, we know that's where the test was. Right. And and we had we had taught we had made that comparison with July 18th as being the test at Carmel. Right. But here we have Elisha instead of Elijah. Yeah. So we have the one on which the double portion of Elijah's spirit has fallen. Yeah. So I go ahead. Oh yeah, I just wanted to bring up I've turned to Genesis 18, 10 to 14, and the woman's response here is a lot like like Sarah's was when she was promised a son in her old age. 
Yeah. Well, the woman's response also in 2 Kings 4.24, she saddled an ass and said to her servant, drive and go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. <clears throat> so what would, the, what would the servant be riding? Well, the ass. So would the servant be riding a second ass? Well, you're saying there's two. Well, does here um, he says, or it says, she saddled an ass and said to her servant, drive, go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So would the woman be walking or would the woman be riding on the ass? She'd be on the ass. So they'd both be on the same one? I don't think so. I think that there's two asses. Yeah, that would be more logical. That's what I would think. So in this situation, the woman or the church goes out on an ass with her servant. Mm -hmm. But she's going out for a righteous reason. And we have the son of Deor back in numbers that goes out for an unrighteous reason, also saddled on an ass with his servant. Mm -hmm. When he went to try to curse Israel. So we have it, we have Islam very much invested in this situation. Yeah. So would the logic of the two asses be representative of the time after 2001 when the movement begins to understand its need to see the child or those that will listen to the message begin to be raised up. Well, it's definitely possible. Um, now you had made this because we had read this this paragraph here, and you, right. you made this. So what you're saying, um, God's displeasure is upon His people, and He will not manifest His power in the midst of them, while sins exist among them and are fostered by those in responsible positions. Right. And, then, and you made reference to this. Of course, we're dealing with Achan. So how, what, what is specifically were you using to make this connection? Because I still don't follow the. Well, we okay. Where is Elisha's room? Well, it's on the wall, it says in the Bible. Would we not consider that an upper room? Yeah, it's an upper room. Yeah. So my point is when Elisha brought the child to raise it from the dead he took that child to the upper room okay mm -hmm. does that make sense yep mm -hmm. okay so the child had no choice in having the upper room experience the child was brought to the upper room for the child to be raised up. Right. For life to be restored. Not unlike the dry bones of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. So the upper room, yes, has been waiting. It's been waiting for us all of our lives. Mm hmm no, we have to come to the upper room. There's no way. We have no choice. That we could move forward until we come to the upper room. Now, the problem here is that, you know, as man, we probably have a narrow understanding of how that upper room experience is going to occur. That is, we have this imagining we go into an upper room together and somehow in 10 days or nine days, however you want to look at it, um, 
we end up confessing our sins. But God is bringing us to that upper room experience through the events that are happening in our lives, in this movement, and in the world. Correct? Right. Exactly. Right. So it's something that we can't avoid. If we're going to be a part of God's movement. And we will be brought to it, however that's going to come about. Right. So what we and, and that upper room is not about the other people confessing their sins to us and admitting that they're wrong. It's about us recognizing the things in ourselves that have hindered the work, that have been like Aiken in this sense. Right. Okay. So as much as we don't, we can't see it or don't want to see it. Now, this is why this next paragraph is so key. Those who work in the fear of God to rid the church of hindrances and to correct grievous wrongs, that the people of God may see the necessity of abhorring sin and may prosper in purity, and that the name of God may be glorified, will ever meet with resisting influences from the unconsecrated. Zephaniah thus describes the true state of this class and the terrible judgments that will come upon them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, if, if we were to read this following paragraph. Sister Angela, would you mind reading this, please? And it shall come to pass at that time, I'm going to have to get rid of all these pictures here, that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leaves, comfortable hiding places away from the wind, because I look that up that say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. <clears throat> Excuse me. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. And Zephaniah means God, God will hide, right? Or the Lord hides. And now we're talking about a hiding place, the leaves. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to get further into this particular group of verses as we continue to go through the book of Zephaniah. But I found it very interesting that Mrs. White would make the comparison of what Zephaniah is, prevent, is presenting here. <clears throat> and again, he is presenting this when? Well, it's during the, during the time of Josiah. Okay. And was Josiah not the last good king of Judah? Yep. So we're dealing with a situation that a, a very specific message is going out. Does Josiah not recognize the blessings and curses of Leviticus 25 and 26? Mm -hmm. So this warning is being given to a king and during a time of a king that has come to an understanding of the seven times. Mm -hmm. Now, please read the next paragraph. Okay, do you want me to read that then? Please. Okay, when a crisis finally comes, 
as it surely will. And God speaks in behalf of his people, those who have sinned, those who have been a cloud of darkness, and who have stood directly in the way of God's working for his people, may become alarmed at the length they have gone in murmuring and in bringing discouragement upon the cause. And like Achan, becoming terrified, they may acknowledge that they have sinned. But their confessions are too late and are not of the right kind to benefit themselves, although they may relieve the cause of God. Such do not make their confessions because of a conviction of their true state and a sense of how displeasing their course has been to God. God may give this class another test, another proving, and let them show that they are no better prepared to stand free from all rebellion and sin than before their confessions were made. They are inclined to be ever on the side of wrong. And when the call is made for those who will be on the Lord's side to make a decided move to vindicate the right, they will, be mani they, they will manifest their true position. Those who have been nearly all their lives controlled by a spirit as foreign to the spirit of God as was Achan's will be very passive when the time comes for decided action on the part of all. They will not claim to be on either side. The power of Satan has so long held them that they seem blinded and have no inclination to stand in defense of right. They do not take a determined course on the wrong side. It is not because they have a clear sense of the right, or says if they do not take a determined course on the wrong side, it is not because they, they have a clear sense of right, but because they dare not. And when they dare not, yeah. they are daring not to support those that are truly following what God has presented before them. And, and they're also, do, do, well, what she's saying here is they dare not uh, take a determined course on the wrong side, right? So, right? so they know that there's a wrong side, and they somehow believe that sitting on the fence is going to preserve them. Right. And the reason they sit on the fence is not an intellectual problem. It's a problem of pride. Okay. Right. In, in this situation. So they, they know what's right and they know what's wrong. And they won't take, they won't stand in a determined course on the side of wrong, but by not standing for right, they really have, have, have declared what side they truly are on. Oh, man. <clears throat> we don't have a choice. <clears throat> There's only two banners to be followed. <clears throat> If we are not willing to follow the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel, we will be under the black banner of the adversary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, it says here, God will not be trifled with. It is in the time of conflict that the true colors should be flung to the breeze. It is then that the standard bearers need to be firm and let their true position be known. It is then that the skill of every two, true soldier for the right is tested. Shirkers can never wear the laurels of victory. Those who are true and loyal will not conceal the fact, but will put heart and might into the work and venture their all in the struggle. Let the battle turn as it will. God is a sin-hating God, and those who encourage the sinner saying, it is well with thee, God will curse. Yep. Now, what do we see here? Well, we know that we have to make a decided stand. And, and we could argue that, um, so let's look at the study we did. We looked at yesterday, last night at um, Odilio's study that he had presented last Sabbath. And there he is saying, basically, we need to stand for the right. That is, we have this prediction regarding the last president of the United States and July 18th. These are all tied together um, with this pandemic and with all the events that have followed. And we believe that Colin is correct and that Trump is going to be the next president. So this is what he says. And, and that if we don't stand with that view, 
that we then are going to be shut out. We'll have a closed door. We'll lose our salvation. At least that's the way I take it. Right. Okay. And, and so a person could look at this from his perspective. We're the ones standing for right. Because we, we're, we're taking a firm stand. And, and somebody like me could be the shirker, right? The guy who's, you know, wishy-washy and, and not ex accepting all this light, not wanting to make uh, a stand for right, but not making, a, not taking a determined course on the wrong side. Just, and, and that's the way that I'm seen by many people. Um, that's the way Daniel Fontenot sees me in that study that we had where he wanted me to basically say he, he was thought that because I didn't agree with all of the conspiracy theories regarding the pandemic, that somehow I accept vaccinations. So, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm stating this in a very open way because we can all look at this situation and take these statements in the spirit of prophecy and justify our actions and condemn others if we chose to do so. But we need to recognize that this is a very direct message to this movement as a whole. It's not something that we can use as a weapon against another person. Well, I think you, I think you were very clear in the study last night. Because we're not here to accuse or point fingers at the other brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. We have to be considering where we stand right now, not where they stand. Yeah. We, it, it, it's up to us to have a right understanding of our position before God so that we can then come together in unity. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not as easy as well, okay, I'm just going to go and apologize for things that I don't feel that I did wrong, just to sort of, you know, like we can't force ourselves into this upper room experience, if you understand what I'm saying. Right. We can't, we can't, we can't artificially manufacture this. The disciples coming to the upper room came as the result of the work and prayers of Christ for his people. And they were brought through this experience. Everything was designed to bring them to that experience of the upper room, all the way from when he called them, even from the time that they were born, but especially from when he called them to be his disciples. Right. And our natural tendency is to sort of look at the others, try to figure out who the Judas is or who the Achan is or who the doubting Thomas is. as somebody outside of us. Or we could be all the above. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Personally. <laughs> I, would, I would suggest that that's entirely true. Right. So, so this paragraph, confessions of sin are made at the right time to relieve the people of God will be accepted, accepted of him. So confessions of sin made at the right time to relieve the people of God will be accepted of him. Because we know right now this movement's in a bad state. The work is being hindered because of the disunity that exists. And so the confessions of sin made at the right time, not the ones that are made when we're brought to the situation of Achan where he makes a confession, but really it's not heartfelt. He's just caught in the act. But there are those among us who will make confessions, as did Achan, too late to save themselves. God may prove them and give them another trial for the sake of evidencing his people that they will not endure one test, one proving of God. They are not in harmony with right. They despise the straight testimony that reaches the heart and would rejoice to see everyone silenced who gives reproof. And, you know, hopefully none of us are going to be that person. And, and we have to be very, very open to see our sin 
and we know that God is driving us to this upper room, and, and that's what has to occur in order for this work to be accomplished. So any, any other thoughts on that? And we'll probably go back to Zephaniah 1. Uh, I have a thought on that is that we need to study the prayers of Christ and resolve with his help to help fulfill those prayers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Because that's the great need that the church has. But we've, you know, this movement tried to bring about unity in a way that's not in accordance with God's will. And what was it? What, what did the movement try to do to bring about unity? Try to form a church, church structure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, it was organization. Yeah. Now, yeah, and, and that's sort of the external thing. But really what it was was conformity. Is conformity unity? No. No, it's not, right? So, and, and a lot of that was sort of, for lack of a better word, kind of bullied that is there was this pressure now when they set up the doctrinal you know committee with the committee there that they had what is it was doctrinal i can't remember the word um which i was in a part of that committee and we we're supposed to read papers and approve them for publication well this was used as a hammer to stifle dissent or various views that um, instead of being where we have to be open to the Spirit of God leading the movement and trust that God can take care of the movement man stepped in and said well we're going to bring about conformity so we got to make sure that all of the papers published are in agreement with whatever the view of the movement is uh, but there was no real clear way how do we would know whether something is true. Why would we set it before man to approve rather than to just let the arguments from God's word speak for themselves? Yes. So, so, you know, so this type of way of bringing about unity through conformity, through man's methods, it will never work. The, the unity is brought about when the individual is brought into union with Christ. And that help that happens as a result of the body of Christ working together. If, if it wasn't for other people, I wouldn't know that I have problems. I could just imagine that I'm righteous. But in contact with others, it becomes evident that I'm unchristlike. And the truths that are being presented, the light that comes from the body of Christ through the Holy Spirit working through all these various individuals, it's that light that's going to bring about that conviction and the power for me to see my sin and to overcome them, to confess them, and to forsake them. When I ran through this last evening, after going through quite a quite a bit here in Zephaniah, yeah, I, I found her statements to be very pointed, but every uh, every one of those pointed statements I found were more of an indictment of myself. So, mm -hmm. so we have, we have quite a bit to cover. We're going to get into Zephaniah as much as we can today. Yeah. But there's still some other things we're going to be addressing. Okay. So as we come here to Zephaniah 1 verse 2. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm going to read a, a little bit here. Um, just because uh, it's kind of running and then we can go back over in detail if that's okay. 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 So <clears throat> I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord, or by the taking away, I will make an end. 
off the face of the earth. Um, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks or the idols of the wicked. And I will cut off from off man from off the I will cut off man from off the land, said the Lord. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the Cameron's with the priests and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops and them that worship and that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm um, or swear to the Lord. So uh, I think that's the part I wanted to read. Oh, oh, and then that turn back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired for him. So this is this first section here. Um, and so just a couple of comments on this that, that I noticed. So it's going to talk in verse um, four. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place in the name of the Cameron's with the priests. So this uh, three, this footnote number three, says this is fulfilled in 624 BC. Now that date's not correct, but um, what is that referring to? What, well, what's the, that? This is, this is the footnote that was given by the translators. Right, yeah. So they put it as 624 because they're using Usher's chronology. Right. Um, and we would place this where? Uh, well, I, I think what they meant to do is place it what we would call 622. That's the 18th year of um, Josiah. But actually, we would place this, uh, because this is going to begin in the 12th year of his reign in 627. Okay. Right? Because that's going to be uh, what we had studied there regarding... Um, in Stephen's study on the table history, where we were going through the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, and looking at the starting points of the 390 years and the 40 years. Right. And, and we had marked this prophecy of Josiah in 977, and that we see that it's going to be fulfilled in 677, or 627, pardon me, right. 350 years later. And so we uh, dealt with that 12th and 3rd year of of josiah so i think that that's what they're referring to except that they're misplacing it in the 18th year and they and usher put the 18th year of josiah in 624. okay so so, so in, it's with, with this with this thought in mind yeah given what we are what we are working and learning mm -hmm. usher places this in 624 we are placing this three years earlier in 627. Yeah, and that's because he's taking, the, the, the translators are taking this and they're applying it to the 18th year of Josiah in the year that Josiah has his Passover. Okay. And, and that's from where Ezekiel is going to count the 30 years, right? He says in the 30th year, in, in the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity, in the fifth day of the fourth month, right? So, so, um, so Ezekiel's first vision is in uh, 30 years after 622, so it's in 592. But, but the tie here, so, I mean, they get the wrong date and they get things mixed up a little bit, but the point here is that we already understand the cutting off the remnant of Baal, that is where he cleanses the land from the high places. And he's going to go to that altar in Bethel, and he's going <coughs> to burn dead man's bones upon the altar, just as it was prophesied in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1 to 5. Right? Okay. <clears throat> and, and so we've never really applied this, but we know that this has to do with the midnight cry message, because that prophecy is given on the 15th day of the eighth month. Right. In, Agreed. In First Kings chapter twelve, it talks about it, and in, in chapter thirteen, and we know that's a symbol of the midnight cry. And Ezekiel is going to pick up on this and make this application with 
with this symbolism. Um, and so the cutting off of the remnant of Baal, this is the work of reform that's done in the time of Josiah. And that's the work of reform that's being done now. Because the remnant of Baal has to do with the Protestant method of Bible study. Would we agree with that? I think it's directly linked with it. Yeah. And we also can see this in this passage too, the stretching out of my hand upon Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is going to be the 2520 that's going to be coming, that first came to northern Israel, right? This reminds us of, what is it, 2 Kings uh, 20, is it 2 Kings 25? I always forget. Uh, no, it's going to be 2 Kings uh, 20, 21 uh, regarding Manasseh. I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet in the house of Ahab. <laughs> And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So, so we can see that this is this reference. And uh, so, so that's kind of the context here of this whole passage of Zeph no. Zephaniah uh, 1, verse 2 to 5. Okay, so if we, we're, we're going to step back for just a second. Yeah. Okay, Zephaniah 1 verse 2 with the alternate reading. By taking away, I will make an end from off the face of the land, saith the Lord. Here again, we're getting the reference of the land, not just the inhabitants, but the land. Right, dealing with the 2520. Correct. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the idols with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. Now, as the translators were looking at this, mm -hmm. they bring us to Hosea. Four verse three. Four verse three. So therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of the heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. But he's the, in, the translators are also making reference to both of Ezekiel's first two visions. Right. Well, dealing with the stumbling blocks, the idols. <clears throat> right. Right. So that's how they're illustrating that these are the stumbling block. It represents idols. Correct. Yeah. They're using Ezekiel to do that. It was interesting for me yesterday. I had a, a man that was driving me to take care of some issues. And we had the opportunity to assist another party. And the other party turned out to be my driver's pastor. We got into some very direct conversations, especially about the idols that are found currently. Now, in America, sports have become an idol. And those that play sports have become an idol. Mm -hmm. Vehicles have become an idol. Possessions have become an idol. All the way through, we are finding elements of idolatry in many things and in many areas that we may not see as being idolatric. Well, even just our, our images that we have of ourselves that we try to project. Right. These, these become idols. That is, they're things that are put in the place of God, of God's character. And... Because the only thing that we should reflect is Christ's character. Right. Our identity is wrapped up in Christ. Now, as we, are, as we are addressing this, there was a second document that I sent to you. Yep. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this letter, please. Yeah, so this one. Whoops. 
You've got to open it up. That's letter 10. That's the yes. letter to Uriah Smith. Correct. Okay. So just hang on. I'll share this. Do you want me to read this then? Start reading it. Let's uh, let's start reading this. I mean, the first the first couple of paragraphs are kind of pointed. Okay, dear brother Uriah Smith, we received your letter last evening, but we really could not understand your letter. <laughs> Sorry for laughing, but no. uh, <laughs> um, it's just anyway. No, I mean <laughs> the the point is. She is saying that she and James could not understand what Uriah was stating. Right. Now, we don't have that letter to compare to understand, but we have her response. Yeah. I do not think that you understand your own position. The Lord has not left you in darkness. He has followed you with testimonies of reproof and warning for years. During this time, you have not sensed your condition. You thought you were in need of nothing. You could not see why you were not why you were not about right. The testimonies of reproof have appeared to you uncalled for. Your great lack has been of coming up and taking your position in seeing and reproving wrong. I called upon you at your house to try to help you. I felt that I had a duty to do in saying to you what I did in regard to the case of Brother Aldrich that your non-committal position sustained him in his wrong course. Your influence and Harriet's, that's um, his wife, his wife Harriet, did sustain and justify the cause of J.M. Aldrich. So in other words, <clears throat> here, just like what we were addressing from the testimony previously read, mm -hmm. we have a party that, is not willing to reprove wrong he's standing aside he's he's sitting on the fence to use the euphemism yeah the non-committal position correct we cannot afford at this time to be in a non-committal position mm -hmm. we are either committed to the work that is before us, or we are committed against the work that is before us. Mm -hmm. There is no third option. Mm -hmm. God was proving his wrongs through my husband and through visions. But notwithstanding the testimonies of reproof, the wrongdoers had your sympathies. And the reprover of wrong, your suspicions and distrust. J.M. Aldrich pleased those who had but little spiritual discernment. The course pursued by J.M. Aldrich was not pleasing to God. His influence had a tendency to draw away from Christ. He was moral and intelligent, of good address and interesting, but the heart was not right. And beneath the surface, the character was defective. Moral spiritual power was weak. His influence upon you and many others was not of a spiritual character. However agreeable his society, however amusing and attractive his conversation, he did not gather with Christ. These are very pointed words hmm. for us today. This letter is written. 10 years after 1863 yep after 1863 mm -hmm. so by this point uriah smith is very much a leader within this newly found church mm -hmm. and so really he's palliating sin here correct and and, and basically, the reproof that's coming from the spirit of prophecy, from God's spirit, he's, 
he's bringing his own suspicions and distrust instead of being a reprover of wrong. Right. So this, this following paragraph. Had you received the testimony God gave in regard to J.M. Aldrich, you would have been saved from spiritual declension and great spiritual blindness and deception. You were pleased with the external J.M. Aldrich. The Lord's eye searched the inmost recesses of the heart and life. Had you prized the light God sent to you, you would have discerned the wrongs existing in J.M. Aldrich, and in the integrity of your, your soul, would have stood with those whom God moved upon to reprove wrong and sin. As you seek to accommodate yourself to the spirit and feelings of those who are not right with God, you imbibe their spirit, and you cannot escape the contagion of their worldly spirit or avoid being influenced by the atmosphere which affects them. You do not perceive your, any danger. You see no necessity for any warning of danger or reproof because of wrong. Read the next paragraph, please. You and Harriet have despised reproof and warning. The Lord knows the value of the soul. He who withheld not his own beloved son to save man would warn and reprove when he sees there is any hindrance to souls attaining salvation. God sees their dangers and sends words of warning to awaken fear. But if those warned are not devotional, if spiritual darkness has blinded their eyes, they cannot see their danger. This I have been shown is your position. So the marital community, the covenant between Uriah and Harriet mm -hmm. have chosen to despise reproof and warning. Mm -hmm. This community was walking in opposition to God. No differently than Achan and his family were walking in opposition to God. They didn't wish to perceive any danger. They thought that everything that they were doing was correct, yet we are being told here that what they were doing was not correct. Mm -hmm. Now, this letter will be sent out I would suggest that Paul read it, take a, a hard look at this, and consider it carefully. Because if this is a this is describing a leadership or a, a party of leadership in this movement, which I believe we have to apply it as then we need to examine for ourselves the positions that we currently hold. I say this for myself as much as I say it to you. Yeah, because every one of us has to look, take a look at this and try to decide and recognize, I guess, the, the evil influence that we have and repent of whatever that is in our own lives. Because again, we can't just take this and say, oh, this applies to this group of people or to that person. Right. Now, if we scroll down and we, we read again, beginning at, at paragraph 23. Okay, so... <laughs> The powers of darkness are at work and are brought to bear more upon those who are engaged in advancing the interests of God's cause. Satan will come in at every avenue, every spot that is not guarded. There will always be a work to do to defend the right and condemn the wrong. I saw that Brother Smith's mind 
had been molded by his past experience in his connection with Sister Smith, that's Harriet, that his sense of wrong is not acute. Satan would plant his hellish banner in his own house and in the office, and he not perceive it, but think it was the banner of the cross of Christ. Brother Smith's position has been a defective one. God wants men who have spiritual eyesight, or they are good for nothing in his cause. <clears throat> cursed, cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, margin negligently, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Moab hath been at ease from his youth, and he hath settled on his lees. There's that expression again. Uh, Jeremiah 48, verse 10. And yeah, 11. Yeah. What does that mean? Settle on your lees is to be on the wind, the leeward side of a house so mm -hmm. that you can be protected from the wind. So, um, <clears throat> to be at, in comfort. Mm. To be in comfort when there is danger. Yeah. Right. Um, the wrath of sorry. what? So you're kind of saying peace, peace when there's storm already. And... Sort of, yeah. Sorry, yeah. continue. The wrath of God was kindled against Saul because he did not carry out his work of justice in smiting, smiting Amalek and utterly destroying them. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. So again, Zephaniah 1 verse 12. Brother Smith has excellent qualifications, but he has a work to do that he has excused himself from performing, and he has not sustained those whom God has called to reprove sin and wrong. Therefore, spiritual blindness has come upon him. So. In this situation, Raya Smith had a very specific job that, that God would have called him to do. He felt, Smith felt, that he was doing God's work to openly criticize both James and Ellen White. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are seeing that the powers of darkness are at work and we're given this, this comparison, here was a letter sent to Uriah Smith sent very directly to him, not just as a testimony, but also as a very, a, a very direct private communication, warning him of his danger. And we can see that within not even seven years that he was fully rejecting this. Now, at this point in time, Zephaniah is giving a warning. Is that warning not intended for us today? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but we're not going to go out with the edge of the sword as far as physically, but it's a, it's a spiritual thing. Okay, but when, we're, when we are going out with the edge of the sword, brother, in this, in this have we not established that the sword we are to be using is that of scripture that we are to absolutely we, we're to hone our sword by our mutual studies together and our examination of scripture so that we become settled in its truths mm -hmm. i agree okay in no manner am I saying we need to weaponize, that we need to carry swords or carry guns. No, but, no, but that's not our, that's not the way we roll. Right. <laughs> I, For lack I, of better words. Okay. I'm just, what, what I'm doing is I'm being very clear that the, the comfort and the sword that we are to carry that we are to make part of ourselves is that of scripture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Line upon line, right? Exactly. 
Now, as we have looked at this as well, Zephaniah 1.4, when we return to this, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. When we read that, are we not also seeing a reference to Ezekiel chapter 9? Um, let me think here. Well, yeah, because I mean, these are the judgments that are going to come uh, in the seven times, right? right? So we know that the one that, that um, now Zephaniah is writing before the second seven times, that is before Daniel's taken captive. Correct. But we can also make the application for what ezekiel is talking about which is the fourth seven times but the the points that we're getting at by the time of ezekiel's second vision that second vision in ezekiel chapter 9 is that also not related to the seven times yeah that's that's what i'm saying it's it's the fourth seven times okay it's going to be the completion of this work so Zephaniah is warning about um, what's going to happen and the inhabitants of, of Jerusalem, specifically with Daniel's captivity. But it's going to lead then to Jehoiachin's captivity and then to Zedekiah's captivity. So there's going to be this progression of events. Okay. So when we're looking at this, we know that the Lord is going to stretch out his hand upon Judah and upon all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. And the name of the Cameron's with the priests. Why is that important for us to know? What is he cutting off of this name? Okay. Well, so he's cutting off the remnant of Baal from this place, um, which which would be this place is Jerusalem, right? Correct. Um, that's the word Macomb. Right, which, which goes back to our study on Daniel chapter 8. And the name of the Camerons, which is these idolatrous priests, these aesthetics or monks, um, with the priests. So you have the, the idolatrous priests and, and the priests. So the, the priests are going to be purified. So sons of Levi are going to be purified. Okay, so in, in this situation, if we are comparing this with Ezekiel chapter 9, yeah. the men with the slaughtering weapons come before the ancients of the house of God. Yeah, and in verse 5, like that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and then that worship and swear by the Lord, and that swear by Malcolm. So the swear by the Lord, that's the word Sheba. And okay. In both cases. All so right. there's this mixture of truth and error. Right? The the false priests and the true priests are both caught up in this error, right? You have right. these pagan priests and priests of Jerusalem. And and basically it's Babylonian worship, which Ezekiel addresses directly, um, showing that God is in control of the heavens. Now now we're going to have to finish here, so. I know. <laughs> what do we have after? So our situation here, as we're looking at this, is Zephaniah is giving us an initial witness to that prophecy in Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. 
Now, since we are coming to the close of our session today, there is an article. I'm going to be sending it to Theodore and asking that this be sent on. Yeah, and it'll be a while till I can send it on again because uh, I have to leave right away. And unless okay. I get the internet, I'll have my laptop with me. If I can get the internet, I'll maybe send it earlier. But okay, now this this article was presented September twenty third, eighteen seventy three, and it is very much in line with what we have been talking about today. Okay. Now, is there anything, and, and this is going to be one of the questions I will ask that we will return to next Sabbath. What can we state about the day of which this article was published? Well, September 23rd? September 23rd of 1873. Well, September 23rd is a date becomes a symbol. Okay. That's um because that's that's used in, in various places right september 23rd is 777 days before november 9th um, um we also have uh well 1873 that's going to be 10 years after 1863 so it's also going to be seven years before the death of james white okay but there's there's another point that hopefully we will we will all come to see by this next week. So I will have this article sent out. We will return to this in Zephaniah this coming Sabbath. So shall we close with prayer unless there are other questions or other comments? Okay, shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to examine this word in detail. We thank you, Father, for your warnings. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you again for the opportunity that we've had to assemble, to study, to discuss, and to examine. Be with us today, guide us in all things, show us that that you would have us to do. Be with us as we go to in, into and with other meetings, help us to understand that which you bring to our minds upon this day. For this we thank you and for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.